Holy smokes, Wes, look alive. It's perfect timing for Linux Unplugged today. We are going to be getting into a conversation around different methods of crowdfunding open source projects, and one of the titans of Kickstarter has launched their brand new Kickstarter project today. They're not, uh, they're not struggling, though, Wes. They have already raised, of a goal of a million, four million. Oh, boy. 22,000 backers with 36 days left to go. They're only a few Blowing hours up. into this thing. It's the new Pebble 2, Time 2, and the Pebble Core. Hey, Kickstarter. We're Pebble. Hey there. In 2012, we came to you with an idea called a smartwatch. All right. Your incredible support helped Pebble smash Kickstarter records not we know once, it. but twice, and ushered in a revolution in wearable technology. OMG, OMG, OMG. Today, we've come home to Kickstarter to push these boundaries even further. That's how we go. Introducing that's how we roll. Pebble 2, a sporty, ultra-affordable smartwatch Sport with a built-in heart rate monitor. All right. Time 2 a premium smartwatch for the active oh, professional, premium. and Pebble Core, an entirely new device for runners that connects to your cellular network and fits in the palm of your hand. Hey, gang, it's time to write the next chapter in wearables. You want my part of gang? I want to be in the gang. Yeah, we're in the gang, dude. Pebble 2 is our latest smartwatch, now with built-in activity tracking. So they got the new watch. Now, now hold on, because this isn't the one you're interested in. But it's neat that it has uh, real-time heart rate all the time. It's waterproof. It does uh, microphones, so you can do dictation. That's all neat. But oh, boy. And with a single click, Pebble 2 is an all-around amazing smartwatch. And starting at just $99, it's the most affordable smartwatch ever. All right, so that's the Pebble 2. But now, Today, we're excited to announce Time 2, oh. our all-new premium full-color smartwatch. What? Machine from marine-grade stainless steel in gold, black, or silver. Oh, Time wow. 2 introduces a crisp new color e-paper display that's 53% larger than the original and packs twice the text on screen, keeping you up to date at a glance. You'll even Time 2's battery that lasts cool. up to 10 whole days on a single charge. Now that is amazing. 10 days? Wow. And like Pebble 2, it has a mic, heart rate monitor, and is water resistant to 30 meters. Both watches also feature an updated version of Pebble Health. Now you can tell Pebble your activity and fitness goals, and it sets targets that automatically adjust based on your performance. Now they also have the new Pebble Core, which is uh, basically just a voice-activated push-button little uh, activity tracker. Pebble's getting big into fitness, huge into fitness. Uh, our network, so you could leave your phone at home. Yeah, Activity started. I like that. Core streams music from Spotify to keep you motivated. So that's kind of a neat thing. So we're going to be talking about this today. We're going to and uh, not necessarily the Pebble, but I think it's really interesting timing for some of the subjects we're getting into. Wes, so you ready to get started? Oh yeah. This is Linux Unplugged, episode one hundred and forty-six for May twenty-fourth, two thousand and sixteen. Unplug your weekly Linux talk show that's skipping pebbles into the body of water that is our mumble room. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. And is that, was that profound, Wes? I'm not going to pretend that made sense, but let's just keep going. The body of water. I also liked I liked Rekai's uh, fighting the Windows 10 upgrade menace. Ooh, much better. Yeah, stay tuned for the post show Rekai, for more on that. <laughs> Coming up on today's episode of the Unplugged program, we are going to talk a little bit about funding open source projects, but in a new light, in something we've never really done before, in projects that have a bit of a name and a bit of a reputation, good and bad. We're going to start with the Mycroft project today, which is delivering some actual software, which you have loaded there and Ham Radio's been trying out. We're also going to talk about purism. They have a new initiative, a new piece of hardware. They claim it is the Microsoft Surface for those of you who respect your privacy and freedom. Big promises. But can we rely on purism to deliver a product like this when you could argue they haven't even mastered the last product they launched? As you can imagine, I have thoughts on this topic. So we'll be discussing that coming up in the show. But before all of that, Wes, before all of that, we have some great open source project updates. How did you get all these links this week? Like, this was a Wes They're blowout. They're just falling out of the sky. You were blowing it out this. You just blowing it out, Wes. Just blowing it out. Speaking of blowing Blow it out, out, you were blowing it out with the beer, too. Well, hopefully you won't be blowing it out. It's a delicious beer, and I... We have to restrain ourselves, Chris. Once again, you have managed to bring a beer into the Unplugged program 
It is from a local brewery that I've never heard of. Sneaking it in under your radar. Copper Donkey. Copper Donkey from the No Lee, I think is how you say it. No lie. Probably, probably. It's L-I. L-I. I I don't know. It it is, oh, it's a good beer, though. It's kind of new. It's from a new brewery they launched uh, just a year ago. And uh, it is also fairly strong at 8%. They're doing a good job already. So Wes brought us a couple of pints. We'll be drinking that on today's program. Drinking along with you, water. Beer, whatever your beverage of choice is. Let's bring in that mumble room. Time of property greetings, mumble room. Greetings, users. Hello. Greetings. Hello. Hello. Greetings. Hello. 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 Good metaphor I, I, here. I picture stacking individual delicious pancakes on top of each other that don't necessarily connect until I take my delicious butter and syrup and, I'm, and I mash my fork down in between them and then bring them all together with my fork stab and put them in my mouth, hence installing software. I actually this think that's why Chris is not a software architect. No, but I, they should just talk to me first because I think it if they would make talk a to me. a great breakfast bar, though. Because, you know, they're going for those IKEA easy to pack things, but I'm telling you, a pancakes might just play a little better. Anyways. Flatpak is the future of application distribution, according to them. The days of chasing multiple Linux distributions are over. You hear that plain, Wes? Standalone apps for Linux are here. Self-contained and future-proof. Distributing applications on Linux is a pain. Different distributions. Don't we know it. <laughs> different distros, multiple versions, each of their own versions of libraries. But Flatpak is here to change all of that. It's cross-platform, it's stable, and it's secure. So you've you know another thing you've heard of in another way you so XEG apps you've also probably heard this referred to as sandbox apps uh, to make it possible for third parties to distribute applications. We talked with uh, someone from the GNOME project in Linux Action Show about this in our Linux Fest Northwest coverage. I don't know Wes. I um they have a demo here. I I think they're really close to shipping it. It almost feels like it's now in that spot where is anybody gonna right. ever adopt this? Yeah, that's what's gonna matter here. We have that. We have a app image. Mumble room. Any thoughts on anyone ever adopting this? Will it actually take off? Will will upstream packages embrace this? I think GNOME are going to embrace it quite heavily. I mean, they're the ones really pushing this. It's mm-hmm. their runtime that's, right. that's doing all the GNOME, the flat pack stuff right now. Uh, the 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 sticking point for me is still the inefficiency of it. Like, I don't want to have 20 copies of the GNOME runtime for my 20 different Flatpak apps. Yeah, do you see a way around that, though, and trying to accomplish what they're accomplishing? I don't, but I think the use case of where they're trying to accomplish it, you know, it, it might be a case of just needing that niche of... It's the same niche that's kind of taken out by rolling releases, so if I kind of think with my Tumbleweed hat, it's like, eh, for, yeah, I don't care. If I think with my Leap hat on, though, yeah, I can see us bundling up flatback apps and mm-hmm. pushing out right. shinier new versions of Gnome apps when previously that would be, like, a complete and utter no-no. Yeah. They have right now on their page, they have nightly builds of GIMP, Inkscape, Darktable, MyPaint, and Scribulus... And they're working on stable builds of the GNOME core applications. Hey. The other thing we have to keep in mind is at the same time this is happening, Canonical has their own solution, which is Snap Packages, which is sort of the sim- a similar solution for their specific right. platform. And uh, I, wonder if, I wonder if that's going to be sort of a, a, duplication, a duplication of effort on some levels. For example, if the GNOME desktop could be bundled up as a Snap Package. Right. Then what about also bundling up as a flat pack? Is who's going to do that work? Right. I think Flatpak has way more going for it because they're trying to be cross distro because they're working with all these other yeah other projects, other distros. That then you know it's no, they don't just think about themselves. Whereas Ubuntu, I yeah, agree, Snap's going to work fine on Ubuntu, but is it going to work anywhere else? But I think if you, I see, I I I would I would tend to agree with you, except. If you look at the way history has played out when it comes to just packaging up installation packages for distributions, you see 
very much, very much like in terms of people will go out of their way to package up for Ubuntu, and in a lot of cases, just Ubuntu. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and and that feels like the same thing. Maybe they're just going to focus on snap packages instead of flat packs. I I, I look at uh, you know I look at uh, there's there's projects out there that we are all familiar with that will soon be repackaged individual components in the entire desktop as snap packages. They're working on it right now. And I don't think they're working on flat packs. That's the thing is the projects I'm thinking of I already know are working on snap versions, and I don't know they're working on anything else. But doesn't that kind of like erode the whole cross distro, you know, appeal? I mean, the the appeal of a flat pack is you do it once, mm-hmm. and then we should, it should work on Ubuntu, work on, and it will work on every distro plus Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. Whereas if you apply the same logic to snap packet packages, right now the only people interested in snap packages are Ubuntu. It, it's like you might as well just do a Ubuntu dev. I, I I completely agree. I just I worry that. The the problem is the people that are making these decisions are idiots or something. I don't know why. I mean, today I couldn't tell you why so many of them only package for Ubuntu. I mean, I could. It's it's market share related, but that might just be what pushes them to use snap packages. I don't know. It's it's probably you're right because Flatpak includes Ubuntu. You hope that gives it the the nudge ahead that just means people will. And if they can get behind the mind, if they, if they can get mindshare out there. That's the other issue. Is Canonical has some momentum behind Mindshare right. already, and the, just the ability to promote a little bit better as a company that has resources to do so and avenues to do so. And if they can have a good, you know, if they can be like, hey, look, have the shiny apps user base that's already going to install 1604, then they might have a good inroad to actually get people using it. Hmm. You can get tra- you can try it right now, though. Uh, it's out there, so I don't know. I, don't know. I, don't know. I, don't know. I really want to talk about today just so that we sort of have flat pack now on our radar instead of XDG. I guess it will probably app. depend too, like how easy is it to create one or the other? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little, how, I'm, how well will they integrate into different build tools or build chains that people are already I'm using? I'm looking at that right now. It might be worth playing with. And you'd be like, hey, Mike, just target this and go. Mm-hmm. I actually like the idea of flat pack and snaps just because I don't have to worry about, you know, whenever I update my system or, or right now that I'm on 1510 and like, 20 apps that I want to try I can't even get yet I agree I think it makes the I think it makes long term support and enterprise distros way more viable too if you can get more modern applications and have a nice stable base I think that's going to be really sweet yep. what do you th- what do you think Wes so the chat room is asking why not why not app image why are we why are we not just app image is already a thing there's already project shipping with app images why aren't we just using app image Wes it, it seems like it's going to be the same thing it's going to come back to adoption and there are a few people, like Subsurface obviously thinks it's great. And it, I don't know, I haven't made an app, so I guess it would come back to like, how easy is it to integrate into existing build systems? How how hard is it to just go from packaging for distros already and having it ship in one of these packages? You know, if Ubuntu provides a really good thing where, hey, you're making a dab already, bam, now you have your snap package, then that would be really nice if it's harder to make a flat, a flat pack or an app image. App image seems like it's pretty simple. Um, I haven't looked too much into, you know, here installing a runtime, yes. etc. But I'd be interested to see a comparison. They have their own build kit and too. It's it's not it's not bad at all. And App Image is really interesting because uh, when you first run it, you have to give you have to manually give it permission to execute. But once you launch it, it asks, do you want to put it in your your menus? So right. it like automatically does that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but maybe it's the the excuse that or the, the complaint that everyone goes against Canonical is like not developed here. Maybe GNOME is doing the exact same thing, and for some reason, people aren't mentioning that. Yeah, and it's a shame we don't have something like the like what we're they're working on, like on container standards. You know, some sort of here we're going to have static I don't think, static I don't think comp- app image is even contained at all, actually. Well, well, just in, in the same way of having some sort of standard for if we're going to do if we're going to have less you know dynamic linking etc. in our in future ways that we're shipping software, it'd be cool if we had some sort of underlying yeah. target so that we could have here's a snap we can convert it to a flat right. Pack. Yeah, for with sure. tools like Alien yeah, or whatever. Absolutely. I think um, I think it's two things. I think it's two things. To, to answer the core question, why not app image right now? I think the first thing is is that the gnome guys have been and gals have been working on this for years. I if you if you recall back, I covered this story as gnome OS in a, in a sense years ago. Like they have been working on different iterations of this crazy idea of applications that can move around, and it's only really once they kind of let it die off, and it was only really once since containers and sandboxing and. All these kinds of different things like Wayland and, and, and namespaces all started to become available options that we could actually ship one day. They got serious about it again, and a core component of it for them, this I believe is the second part, is sandboxing. 
They believe sandboxing fundamentally, and I've linked it in their wiki why they believe this. And I, they don't, they don't want to use sandboxing for the reasons that like you traditionally think of, like prevent you from getting access to things on your system. It is legitimately to isolate the application, to move it around, and to protect the overall system. And that's a core functionality for them. Right. And they see it not just core to security, but core to how these things are portable to begin with. And I think App Image is a great solution. I personally, I'm, I'm happy to download an App Image thing. I just really, ha- it really hasn't been an issue for me. Yeah, exactly. App Image has actually been around for a while too, because they were originally the portable apps mm-hmm, project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's true. And uh, it's, true. it's really, it's a really cool idea. But as far as like the containerization and the sandboxing, they don't really have any of that. So, so I guess in a way, they're kind of improving the concept with the Flatpak. And also, Flatpak's a cooler name. <laughs> yeah, way better. Yeah, they are doing a better job with the branding, so hopefully that yeah. will help you know people. Start yeah, shipping and I think things. the other thing that just maybe just to finish up the Mindshare thing is I think this is another example of Mindshare, where Mindshare yep. makes a difference, and App Image has gotten traction among some of us, but it just really hasn't gotten the Mindshare. And part of that is, and this is the part we just have a hard time connecting the dots with, is there are people from the GNOME project that are going out to technology conferences like Linux Plumbers Conference and 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 the and the Gua, and Guadec and and Fedora Fedora's conference and all the different conferences and they are they are promoting this idea they are talking about this idea they are engaging with people about this idea in a way that is probably at a higher intensity than the App Image project. Well, it kind of makes it feel like if you're targeting our platform, here's our solution for this. Rather, App Image feels a little bit like you're an independent developer with a one-off app. Here you go, you can package it up with us. Totally, totally. That I think that and that's a big way about that's a big you have to remember that's how the GNOME project thinks right that's a and, and that's a big part of it and also I would say last but not least I think it just underscores how important the in person advocation and meetings and discussions are to really move some of these important technologies Make it feel real. Yeah, to move them through an open source community where everybody kind of has to sign off and implement in all the different f- fiefdoms and the and that's something I think that the GNOME project is just better at. Speaking of that exact thing, SystemD. SystemD uh, has a big update, uh, version 2.3.0. When's the last time we even mentioned SystemD on this show? And the reason why it's we're, been bring- a while. Yeah, we're bringing it up, because let's not kid ourselves, in terms of uh, how long these things have been around, still kind of an early project. And this is a big update. A lot of things are changing. <laughs> right? And it's one of those that uh, they recommend themselves. The project recommends that even the more aggressive distributions keep this one in testing for extra longer. Did you see that in there? I did see that. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a bunch of stuff like DNSSEC being turned on by default, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I wanted to jump right down to the one you're the most excited about. This, I because it's I, I get it on some level, but I think you have a bigger reason why you like it. And essentially what it is, is the systemd networking stuff will now allow a unique identifier to be sent in a DHCP request. Uh, and you can configure it for each system in the .network file managed by systemd networking or networkd. And they'll have different like DUIDs and DUID raw data and IAID options. And I would guess this would be, well, I, I'm guessing so that when you're spinning up a bunch of machines, you know what machine it is somehow. I mean, why not? Why why not just use MAC addresses, et cetera? Well, it, so, so part, it's, it's mostly that. So you can't, you do have control over the MAC address, but with uh, IPv6 and like if you're using oh. DHCP v6, uh, um, you can no longer, for a lot of systems, use a MAC address. To They use something, to, uh, the DUID device unique identifier or something like that, uh, which is a longer string of hex characters in a similar fashion, you know, like, like any kind of UUID. But that is sent to identify a device. Uh, so this adds support. I've enjoyed SystemD Network D. It's not going to do everything, but for servers or especially containers where you right. probably already have SystemD. Containers running, for sure, right? And you, just, you can make like a two-line file to enable DHCP on all your interfaces. So when you're spinning up a new container... Bam, you know, ha- you have addresses. And then this just lets you add, which which I've been looking forward to do for when I want to, you know, I have some some containers where I just like, they're going to be ephemeral. I just want them to spin up, get an address, do something, disappear. Some like I'm going to have more permanent and maybe they need static IP addresses or I'm going to have them in DNS or something like that. So this will let me easily just add a line where you can change that identifier and you can change like interface specific or for the whole system and you can change the DHCP. You can change it to have send a unique identifier instead of the MAC address. Hmm. Uh, so it'll just make it a lot easier, and then your you know your DHCP server will just pick them right up, give them the address that they want. Also, a bunch of stuff changed with systemd logindy in this release too. So that user the user stuff is pretty big. Yeah, what is it? And for my understanding, so they're trying appe- to solve a problem where when you when your user session is over, now all of your programs will be terminated. Right. So if you have a Tmux running, it will be terminated. 
So that's one of the big changes that they're stressing here that people will be looking out for. That was it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And I think in some regards, it will, there'll be a point in time where we just think that's obvious that it should be the default behavior, but it's a big transition. Before it is it a lands. huge transition now. And it, and it, you know, it just kind of makes sense. It does fit. If you, if you adopt what they suggest and you, you know, use it system, do run to run it in the right scope and is it, you know, in the right user scope and everything, then, then yeah, you can account for it well and you can control its resources, et cetera. And probably you'll have, you know, there'll be a lot of stuff where you're going to set up like a user level service for it anyway, so it won't matter. Yeah. And that was, that is definitely the, that's going to just definitely make sure you do set that up that way, which is just best practice anyways. Right. There are, I have seen way too many people where you're like, oh, I'm just going to, yeah, it works. I tested it out. I run it in a TMUX session. It works. Mm-hmm. And then they never, <laughs> they never properly daemonize it. And you're like, yeah. Yeah, so watch out for that one. And we have a link in the show notes with more info. Anything else jump out at you? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of interesting stuff. It depends on how you feel about System D, but they keep yeah. plugging along. Yeah, they do. So the, the full release notes are in there. Uh, all right, then uh, watch yourself. We got a little Valve update. Kind of, sort of. Not directly a Not Valve directly. Update. It's just, uh, let's see, where's my, uh, here it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got it right here. <sighs> my uh, My Steam controller. I, I, I bought the Steam controller thinking this is going to become the de facto Linux controller. This is the one when you're, you're going to use. Erase the sun. That's yeah. what you'll be using. Yeah. No more Xbox 360. It's going to be this guy. And uh, I no think go? no. Well, um, the big problem was is it's been so directly attached to Steam. Right. That I just the the extra hassle of having to open up if, even if I want to just play a game I installed from a repo, having to open up Steam and configure and all that kind of stuff, it was a real bummer for me. So I want to introduce you to SC Controller. Man, I love open source. Look at this thing. It's a this GTK. Looks well done. Yeah, it's a GTK UI for configuring your Steam controller, setting up all the buttons, what they do, mapping all of the different stuff. It allows you to configure it completely without ever launching Steam. Profile, so you can switch between games. It's got stick pads and gyroscope input, haptic feedback support, macros, rapid fire, mode shift, and you can also enable emulation for the Xbox 360 for mouse, wow. trackpad, and balls, and keyboards, and all that. Yeah. Maybe uh, some. Maybe next week we'll have to give that a go. Maybe, maybe, yeah, because it was just pretty, pretty, er, uh, just uh, posted over at GamingOnLinux.com, and I'm really impressed by this. When was the last time you played with that bad boy? Hmm. Well, at least two machines ago. Right. Yeah, because I've had some machines in and out here. We've been moving hardware around. Yeah, so there you go. I think that's really neat. And it's posted up on GitHub. We have a link in the show notes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. That's a good... Uh, Liam says at the bottom of his post that uh, Valve should really hire this guy to speed up uncoupling the Steam controller from big picture. Yeah. yeah there you go. Yeah. Have you tried it? Do you want to... Have you... Have you want to you wanna manhandle it there? You want to... Ooh. Yeah. That's nice, it right? It is smooth. That's nice. That's nice. Okay. So just a super quick little uh, heads up for you out there that are on Fedora and want GUIs for all the things... Yum Extender is a GUI for managing, you guessed it, Yum and DNF. Really, DNF now. It's a front-end graphical interface for DNF. You can check it out. We have a link in the show notes. It's called Yum Extender, and uh, Yum Extender, powered by DNF. Man, between that and that System D, I know. what can't you manage with that's, a GUI? That's right. That's, that was the thing. That System D manager works Looks pretty well. pretty sweet, yeah. <laughs> we talked about that in this week's Linux Action Show, if you guys haven't seen that. Okay, so before we jump any further, we have a lot still to cover in the updates. We're getting to, we probably need to pick up the pace. We probably need to shake shake it off like Mariah Carey. So first, let's talk about Ting, because we got to get legit here for a second. got to get real. It is mobile that makes sense. No more messing around with stupid uh, guesses on how many minutes you might use or megabytes or messages. It's just pay for what you use over at Ting. they got no contracts, no other termination fee. Six dollar dollars. That's it. Six dollars is all you pay for the line. Girl, are you hearing that? Whoa. Six dollars. Plus, you got the Uncle Sam taxes, because Uncle Sam loves his cut. You got to pay for that. such a good deal. He needs something. Got to pay for them, something, something. all the important federal programs somehow. So things got to pay the pet taxes. So, all right. So it's six dollars taxes, and then just what you use. You on Wi-Fi? You're not paying for nothing. You want to get updates from your uh, Android phone? Ting don't care. Ting is honey badger. They don't care. They don't care. You can Why get updates. They? they don't care. You can get updates. Go to right now. You ready? Linux.ting.com. Linux.ting.com. That's where you go. You get you get yourself a little savings, like twenty five bones. Linux. You support this show. If you got a compatible device, and you just might, because they got CDMA and GSM, you'll get credit on your account. Yeah, I'm not playing. You get credit. It's probably going to pay for more than your first month, because that's how freaking inexpensive Ting is. All right, so you get the credit on the account. Then you're so happy with it, you go do a little evangelizing. 
Now, I'm not telling you not to send people to linux.ting.com, because that would seriously help out our show if you spread that around. But I'm just saying, if you're a Ting customer, they got a referral program. Yeah, yeah. You, they, they got a referral program. A referral program. They got a referral program. And I don't what kind s- of program is that? It's a referral program. And if you get people to switch over to Ting, you get a little something, something. And the reason why I don't want to say too much is because it's... I think it's a better deal than I can get you, but Ooh. just get started by going to linux.ting.com. Just go right there. Check yeah. out your prices. They got early termination relief programs. If you got stuck in one of them duopoly contracts like a sucker. Never again. I was there. I was there. I feel you. I was there. I'm not Chump. there again. No, no. I, I, I have moved on. I have seen the light. Ting. Ting. Linux.ting.com. It's different. Ting keeps rates simple. We don't make you pick a plan. Instead, you just use your phone as you normally would. How much you use determines how much you pay each month. You can have as many devices as you want on one account. That's good, because when you use more, you pay less per minute, message, or megabyte of data. Your usage, plus $6 per active device on your account, plus taxes, is your monthly bill. Simple. That's what we mean when we say... All right! Mobile. That makes sense. I like this one, too. They got a good post up there by Luke about data caps. (gasps) <gasps> and about what a SOB they are when you're trying to cut the cord. They got a great blog, too. You can go read it. Just start by going to linux.ting.com. Linux.ting.com. And thanks for sponsoring the Unplugged program. All right. Roll up your sleeves. Whoa. LibreOffice is getting to work in the Italian Army. Following the announcement made last year, the Italian Army has moved forward with its plans to replace Microsoft Office with LibreOffice. So far, the Army has tested its plan across 5,000 workstations. Wow. Without any major problems, too. Yeah, yeah. Now, they have... This is just the beginning, Wes, because once they get through this test program, this is the part I really like. Like, okay, yeah, that's great. You know, they're aiming to replace all MS Office by the end of the year. Okay, hmm, we've heard this story before. This is the part I like. The Department of Defense is also working on e-training materials to help new users adapt to LibreOffice quickly. And once these materials are complete... The department aims to release them under a copyleft license. This will be a great contribution to the LibreOffice project and will increase the adoption of the Office suite across Italy. Now that's, that's a very good point. Like, yeah, I was just reading uh, Visual kicker. Basic turned 25. <laughs> but uh, VBA, right, the scripting language in so many of their Office projects, that still exists, but it's not a major, like, it's used all the time, but it's not being heavily developed. There's so many things with open source here, like, if, if the Army has a, some sort of pain point or they need an enhancement of a feature... They can pay developers to do that, and everyone benefits. That's true. That's true. And they don't have they don't have to wait for it to be in the interest of the parent company. Yeah, and really, why not? If you're going to use the public's money to do something like this, why not? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice thing too. You know. Uh, okay, so Wes, you had a little bit of an Arch story. I secretly use Arch Linux, and I thought this was kind of perfect because it's about bringing PPAs to Arch. Which, as Popey is a recent arch switcher, I'm sure this is going to be great for him. This will kind of make it all. Need something like this to yeah, know, make it familiar facilitate for him. his workflow. Yeah. So this is a new tool that would allow you to create basically what they're calling PPAs for Arch, which is kind of. I don't know if I like the branding yeah. or the title, but no. it does, the functionality does seem like something maybe I could use. Think of the Arch PPA like a do-it-yourself PPA personal package archive in the style of PPAs. Think popular Ubuntu's operating system PPAs, but hosted for you on your own terms, either locally or on a server that you have access to, and they allow you to distribute packages to hundreds of thousands of possible Arch users. Arch-PPA developer Ryan McGuire says that he created this utility to help the Arch Linux personal packaging ecosystem be more secure than it is right now by making your own private repo that doesn't get its audits contributed back upstream, and officially recognizing software repositories where anyone with the proper skills can now upload, they can have their own repo. Wow! This is where Arch PPA comes in handy for AUR package maintainers who are looking for an easy way to create a manual repository that they can maintain with the Arch Linux packages they want to distribute in a secure, safe environment. I love it for a LAN-like repository. Yes, exactly. Or on your VPN or whatever. Nothing about that's like a PPA. No, <laughs> I also don't like see an right, and I don't think people are going to suddenly add a bunch of these repositories when there's already the AUR in place. I yeah, like the that, Popey in the exactly. chat room says we start moving. They just as we start moving PPAs to snaps. <laughs> but um, bum, boy, I wish I had a comedy horn for that. That's good, good point. That's that. I will probably set this up and play really? with it. Really? Now, what what's the use case, Wes? Well, Seriously. mostly things just like um, uh, like maybe like the ZFS module. You just build it, build it once there, and then. Anyone else can, can jump right in? 
I think it's because he hasn't re- refreshed his machine in a while, so he wants to try some more weird stuff. Yeah, I was thinking, that's what I was thinking, chilled uh, Primary, I guess. Chilled Primary says that uh, it's a great for the enterprises. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can kind of have, you can build your own. Build People your own use Arch in the Enterprise, in, though? In, in, I mean, some not must. The, I not grant. that you are. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> but you could now, I guess. Well, it doesn't have to could, necessarily even be anyway. from the AUR, right? It's just kind of a way to like, you can make your own package builds for whatever, your own proprietary software or whatever, and then this will compile it and host a repo for you so that any other Arch machine can be configured. Maybe you want your own mm-hmm. custom kernel that you want to compile mm-hmm. on your build host, mm-hmm. host it here, you know. That seems uh, good. What, what I was thinking is instead of getting it directly from the AUR, before you push it to users, you check out the script. Yeah, it's fine. Then I push it to users. You know, you control the rates of how much comes from the AOR, how fast. Or you then, and then you whack out your latest version of your package, you run all your build tests, you run all, all the rest of your tests, and then you push it to Brad. Yeah, and if it does handle some of the dependency logic for you, that is, yeah, that is really nice. You're right. Yeah, okay. All right, now I'm starting to see it like for, for I wish I had more droplets that still used Arch. I only have one left that uses Arch. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's like I just have it as a matter of principle now. You know, I just I keep it up because, well. You have to. I can. Uh, SYU and- every day, brother. <laughs> Now, this was a big story out of Google I.O. We really haven't covered Google I.O. in any of our uh, shows much except for Coder Radio. But I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about this one because I think you found this link here, Wes. It gives us a little insight about how they're going to be running Android apps securely on Chrome OS. And you guessed it. Containers. They're going to be using containers Containers. on Chrome OS. Yeah, Uh, Not just containers, though. I'll tell you about it. So this is looking at a development preview, uh, which is you're going to have other versions available in August. You guys can get your hands on. But apparently, Chrome OS has taken advantage of containers to get this Android app compatibility. The full Android framework is implemented in a Linux container that isolates Android from the rest of Chrome OS and puts its apps in a sandbox. And here's a little bit of a diagram if you're watching the video version. Yeah, that was a nice diagram. A hardware abstraction layer has been built between Android and Chrome OS that runs native ARM code on Chromebooks using processors with ARM instruction and emulates it on Chromebooks using Intel processors. With SE Linux, ah, yes, the secure version of Linux implemented Android 4.3 back in uh, 2003 on Android and in Chrome OS in 2012, the Android framework runs in a container that isolates it from other containers and OS modules using Linux functionality called namespaces. Android is granted only specific privileges to view and interact with Chrome OS hardware resources, such as keyboards, cameras, communication stuff. The isolation prevents potentially harmful code within the Android container from interacting with code outside Android containers. So containers in SE Linux is how they're going to get Android apps on Chrome OS. Hopefully that does mean we'll be able to see it ported to other Linuxes at some point. Yeah, but Who knows, there's going to be a lot to set up. Yep. Yeah, every time this comes up, I think what I actually use these apps on Linux. It's also so strange to see, like, using, you know, kernel technology, but in such, like, a far removed and heavily packaged and it's just consumer a focused. Right. Yeah. Taking some hardcore, like, server grade stuff. Very strange. I mean, it's cool. It's neat. That's, but. I guess I would check out the Photoshop app. If I could try out the Photoshop app, I might try that. And Evernote, maybe. Mm hmm. Yeah. Evernote, Photoshop. I don't know. I, I mean, there's there are a few so, things. Sling, Bubble UPMP is Sling good. TV. Oh, yeah. I would I would like that too. I would like that. So I guess there's a few. There's a yeah. Okay. All right. I, maybe Google Play Music. Maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Look at that GitHub script there. Uh, Moo ha 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 ha. In the chat room, links uh, the DigitalOcean Debian to Arch script. That is a thing. That's also a great script if you want to learn a little bit how, how like init ramifests and pivot root and that kind of stuff works. I would definitely recommend checking those out because there's some clever stuff you could do to convert it, a running system. Yeah, you convert a running Debian box into an Arch box. Right. <laughs> it's just awesome. It helps now that there's system D involved. Like if you ever like in a conversation with somebody like, what can Linux do that Windows can't do really? What can what can like because I got video games and I got Exchange and Outlook. What can what can Linux do? And you're like, well. Let me show you this. Right. Come here, son. Sit down. <laughs> Let me show you something. Yeah. Uh, all right. So anybody in the moment room have thoughts about Android apps on Chrome OS? I don't sense a lot of interest from you guys. Well, I'm not really interested. Okay. It's so. cool. It's, it's something that I would like for people who already have a Chromebook. Because I know people who have them, uh, even though I kind of didn't want them to get one, they get it anyway. So it kind of because they in this and immediately they started complaining about not being able to install stuff and things like that. So we, we kind of solved their problem, but really other than that, nah, I don't care. 
Hmm. All right, who else? I know a couple other people want to uh, speak up. Go ahead. Um, the Play Store is has a wide variety of apps, and which which is and which games with them. Yes, and which is far better than the Linux desktop is available right now. For example, uh, Bacon Reader is the is the best Reddit client I've ever used, and nothing on Linux can match it. So, but but you if you can't have too many selection of apps, so adding the Android ones is is, is good. I, I can't see how. I mean, they're not going to be. Our, if theoretically they could become Linux based with the container structure, but I mean hmm. right now even even like it's they're not even released yet and it's gonna be like a couple of months before it even becomes beta so yeah the likelihood of it becoming to linux will be very long time away i'm kind of curious to hear what richard thinks just from the perspective of uh uh from open susa too just i i hear well android play store has a lot of great apps that linux desktop doesn't have and i i guess maybe like this little primitive part in the back of my brain goes oh is that a threat is that a threat to linux is that a Hold on, are we gonna? Are we never gonna get to the desktop now? If something based on Linux has these great proprietary Play Store applications, what do you think, Richard? Is that not really apples and oranges? Is it a is it a fair threat? Your thoughts? I, I I've seen a few times now of like trying to get mobile apps running on the desktop. I mean, it's it, I think I, I, well, I even had it running on one of my machines a while back, like way in like the early Android days when that kind of stuff wasn't too crazy. Um, it it never really appeals because it, it is like it, it it isn't the right you know the wrong form factor the wrong screen it, it's like the same thing you already have with like Android phone mm, apps yeah. and Android tablet mm-hmm. apps well you're gonna have what Android laptop apps yeah that is gonna be funky huh yeah embedded Wes your thoughts for people that might want this over say like an iPad like your real basic user. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it has a place for for people like that who are just, you know, going to use it to check mail or play games. I think that it could be more beneficial than a tablet because it gives you a little bit more flexibility. I just don't think it could ever replace, like, at least for me, like a true, you know, operating system where I get file system access and stuff like that. Hmm. I mean, it is compelling to get be able to buy like a three hundred dollar, or two hundred dollar, or one hundred eighty dollar laptop that has Chrome and Android apps. But and I could see people like people who are already heavily invested. They've got the Pro apps for sure. all the different. Yeah. You know, oh, sure. I've got my Juice SSH Pro. And, you know, like whatever all the things. Or if are, like, games could actually work, and there was a ooh, there yeah. was like a well known game that comes out in the Play That's Store. True. Wes, let me ask you this because this move and instant apps, which I'm sure you're familiar, like you search for something in Google search. And the link comes up, and actually, instead of go, taking you to a website, it launches the just the bare minimum app yep. from the Play Store on the fly. Mind blowing is this move: Android apps coming to Chrome OS, which Chrome OS, the web operating system, the operating system for the web, the open web, Google open web platform. Is is this and instant apps a massively anti web, anti open web ecosystem move? Is this Google saying, ah, you know what? You can't really have good app experiences in the browser. If you want good apps, you got to go native. I mean, a little bit. I, I don't know if that's fully their intention, but I can definitely see it as the con- as a potential consequence of that. I think they are still invested enough in the web that they don't. I don't. I don't think that sure. And all of them, especially as the giant organization they are, could be invested in that. But you're right, and it does it does build in that weird side premium extra layer that it just doesn't you know it's not it's not really standard well and as as somebody you got to wonder too like it, it really it really i would rather just if if i go to the web and i search for something in google on the web there's a very high likelihood that i want a web result right you're like you're already using it. I don't want if I want that app, I will go install that app. I, I find that whole. I thing have already been like frustrated by that. Yeah. So I, I guess it's it's it is it, things are changing and Chrome OS is is becoming a, a new beast that will be entirely competitive on a different level. And I think Richard absolutely is right. If they don't nail the UI experience, which is going to be damn near impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just don't see how serious users will want to use it outside of note taking apps and, right. and things like that. Uh, I, I guess. Uh, I, JM, I will give you your la- the last words on this because it does kind of feel like a convergence of the two platforms in a sense. Using, because uh, 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 in a sense, if you look at that diagram, just core fundamental Linux technologies to bring the two together. 
Sure. I mean, this has been the long-term strategy with Chrome OS and Android. They've always planned to bring the two together eventually, and they're going to be the premium place where developers will go to publish their apps because it will be Google first. Forget Windows, forget Mac. It will be on Google's platform. Interesting. I think you're probably right. And nothing else we can do other than watch at this point. Right. Yep. So we move on. Uh, and talk about it. That's what we're here yeah, for. We, and, and observe. And, and then when it lands, we're like, told you! <laughs> you know what else they told you about is DigitalOcean. This is yeah. really where you should go to spin up infrastructure on demand. Now we know, we know that the key decision you have to make is when you're using cloud computing, it has to be done on a system that's actually good. This is where DigitalOcean comes in. they got data centers all over the world all over the world, using Linux as the base operating system, KVM as the virtualizer, SSDs for all the disk I.O., 40 gigabit E connections what? into the virtualizers, Class A data centers all over the world, Wes. It is really, it's like nothing you could ever mm, roll out that's yourself. That's a beautiful picture. And then they come in there. They come in there with that crazy VC funding, that hoopspa, and that great product, and all of a sudden they blow up, and they're able to offer you real time, I mean, like, well, Less than 55 seconds. Spin ups of virtual machines boop, 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 boop. starting at $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM. Say what? A 20 gigabyte SSD, a blazing fast CPU, and a terabyte of transfer with a baddical, baddical UI. Nothing like this you've ever seen to manage your digital ocean droplets. Shoot, son, girl, please. Nobody's got an interface like this, but then to back that up. The best API. Oh, man. The best API. Oh! You know, uh... First if you're, class. If you're, uh, if you're an API snob, you're hanging out in the bar, you're talking about APIs with your API snobby friends, drinking your martinis, DigitalOcean's the top of the list. Everybody talks about DigitalOcean. Mm. It's that API. It really is. What's great about it is there's tons of open source applications already yeah. written that you don't have to write yourself to take advantage of it, so you can be super lazy. But if you hate all of them, the API docs <sighs> are great, so you just write your own. And, you know, back to that interface. Back, back, back to that interface they got. They got HTML5 console so you can manage your machine from boot all the way up to post. One-click application deployments. One thing you got to do, though. One thing. Hold on, Wes. Let me make sure it's legit. Let me see. Double check. Double check. I'm checking here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Multiply that. Carry the Go two. this over here. Let's see. And then just... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'll just run this crunch over here. Let's see here. Get it out of here. Oh, yes. That's right. If you use the promo code DO Unplug, that's the thing they have mm. to do. I thought it was just go there, create an amazing system, get your work done, experiment with something, put it into production, use whatever damn distro you think is best, and then enjoy their incredible documentation. I thought that's all I had to say. But then I remembered... We would like to do episode 147. We really would. So you got to use that promo code DO Unplugged. That's the thing. Keep us here. You got to do that. You get a $10 credit. You try out their $5 rig, two months for free. Keep us going. Use that promo code DO Unplugged and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Unplugged program. Now, Wes, there's this crazy upstart out there. And I don't, I don't think Ryan's not in the mumble room, is he? He's not in there? No, I don't see him. There's this crazy project out there that's working on this thing to compete with Google Home or whatever they're calling it, the Amazon Echo, and we've talked about it before, it's called Mycroft. And recently, the Mycroft project released Mycroft Core 0.6 Alpha. Shipping! Shipping some code. And they've put it up on GitHub. You can download it and get it running on Ubuntu. Uh, Whoa, what was that? What was that? I think that was a space-time distortion. I, I think, think so, yep. Yeah, we hit a micro-fragment. That was the Mycroft AI in the future, reaching back. Mm -hmm. That's exactly Tell what I was thinking. Tell us to keep going. Because I was about to show you the Mycroft with its pants off. Look at this. Now, oh, isn't it just so cute? That is, this is the dev unit here. And if you're watching the video version, we have this linked, the video in the show notes. The Mycroft with its pants off, so you can see all the guts here. And this thing is, it's looking really good. And this is just a yeah, prototype, right? I, I'm, mm, I'm impressed. But what's so great about Mycroft in this Amazon Echo era now... You mean besides is, their name? Yeah. Yeah, that is a great name. You're right. That is really brilliant. And it, it, what's so great, though, and it's not... What also is great is they're open sourcing tons of different code. But the oh, thing that man. I really love about Mycroft, the thing that really gets me excited about Mycroft, is you can just get Mycroft Core and install it on any damn thing you want. And that, what? that means I could truly eventually, if I had the chutzpah and initiative, I could deploy 
Minecraft ubiquitously in my life. I could have it on my Cody box. I could have it on my server. Minecraft, I could have it on my desktop. I could, right. I, I mean, it, it truly, because I'm not going to buy 50 Google Homes or 50 Amazon Echoes no. or whatever. But if I could get a couple of Minecraft devices where I don't want an easy button, and then I can install the software in all the other places, right. like my phone, like my desktop, like my laptop, like my server. Old computers, whatever. Yeah. So... I know you've been playing around with it. I think Ham's been playing around with it. I, I don't know. Have you actually gotten it started yet? Because it's pretty early days still. I, I haven't. I haven't quite. But uh, I haven't had time to look into too what's much. The, of the what's the process like? But it's a it's a Python app, and uh, they have some nice scripts that'll install all the app dependencies for you and set up a virtual environment. I, I haven't gotten the sound. Have I? You know, I haven't gotten it working quite yet. But I'm sure if I play with it for a little bit longer. Uh, yeah. I'm excited to get it to work. Now, uh, Ham, you were saying in chat earlier today that you've been playing with it too. Yeah. Yeah, I actually got it working. Um, I cloned the Git repo and I d uh, read the re README uh, file. Um, super easy. The 0 0.60, uh, I couldn't get it to build, but they released a new version just a day or two later, 6.1. Oh, nice. And uh, that one built for me super easy. I rebooted the computer, like they said, uh, opened the terminal, three terminal instances, and uh, ran in the commands they said, and I got Mycroft running. I said, hey, Mycroft, you know, um, open up CNN.com. And it opened up CNN.com, opened up Thunderbird just fine. A um, few problems here and there, but it's pretty cool. Now, you, did you also have to, like, create an account with, like, the intent parsing service or something like that, which I guess is going to be, they're going to be moving to an open source solution, but right now you have to, like, go create a, an account somewhere, right? Oh, that is that is correct. Uh, Cerberus.mycroft.ai, I think it is. Yes, I did have to create an account there. But that's just pretty quick and simple, and that's just used to do some of the speech recognition, I guess? Oh, yeah. Um, I signed in using my Google account, and so it took like two seconds to okay. sign in. Okay. And um, I just said, Mycroft, uh, pair up my device, and Mycroft uh, gives me a little <laughs> code. I put it in there, and it, I was paired within literally two minutes. Can you, can you, what, can you try other things? Like, can you ask it for weather? Can you, is there any additional things you can ask, or is it pretty basic right now? I asked, what's the weather? And it, Gave me the weather for some place in Kentucky or something. I don't know. And I'm like, uh, hey, Mycroft, uh, change my location to, you know, Lewiston, Idaho. And it totally didn't get it at all. Yeah. So <laughs> um, it, does it feel sort of like a like a verbal command line right now, or does it feel like you're having a conversation? Like a verbal command line, it is not a conversation. I mean, it did when I asked what's the weather, and it said it's sunny out here. You better get your. It said you better get your sunglasses. Um, <laughs> that's kind of so, fun. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's two different types of assistants right now. Uh, I feel like uh, uh, Siri and Google Now and and Amazon Echo really are very much. They're they're command lines, and if you learn to say things in this precise order, like you know. Hey there, Googs. Set a reminder for 5.30 p.m. It works pretty well. And then it'll say, what would you like a reminder for? Right. Remind me to tell Wes that he's awesome. And then it sets a reminder, right? And you have to very much walk through a sequence like that. And what the next generation that, of artificial intelligence is doing is more conversational. And, and you see we're kind of there now. But they're not necessarily as reliable because they depend on being able to suss out your intent right. and your and context, whereas the command line is a little more intentional, a little more exact, and it can also be replicated on text. And that's where I really think – I was joking earlier, but I, I would love to see – so Microsoft, Mycroft has this intent engine, and I would love to see if this thing could be integrated at all different aspects. If it's open, if it truly is, it's all open, right. and my desktop is open, could Mycroft intent be integrated into the app launcher to learn what apps I most frequently launch? Could Mycroft intent be integrated into my contacts application? Could this go, could this be a pervasive artificial intelligence system for the Linux desktop? Something that is not driven by necessarily a strategy tax by a larger right. parent company or something like that. I just find the possibilities to be really compelling because so it's not a just a hardware box, right? Because yeah. it's software. Even though you haven't got it working yet and it's kind of hit and miss, like it is possible. Ham's got the beginning version of Absolutely. it. And this is 0 0.6 alpha. That's really cool. Anybody else in the mom room have any thoughts on the topic? 
Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, oh, go, go ahead, go Popey, ahead. And, then, and then North. Uh, so I was at Oscon last week, and I met Ryan Sipes, the CTO of uh, Mycroft AI, and uh, I held one of the Mycrofts in my right. hand for the first time. I saw, I saw your tweet. That was wow. great. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he said to me that, I asked about the the voice stuff and you know whether it was whether whether the new voice print was ready. And he said they've got a new version. They've they've been regenerating you know all the all the sounds. Um, and he said there was a problem with one of the early ones that uh, the voice sounded a little bit like Max Headroom. So we go ha, 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 hello <laughs> and. Uh, he really wanted to keep that in, but they decided, no, it would be unprofessional to do that. So they got rid of that, unfortunately. I, I really want that. <laughs> yeah, that would be maybe later. Maybe later. That would be good. So, Popey, did you get it? Was it was the noise environment uh, suitable to trying yeah. it at all? How was that like? Not really. Yeah. Because the um, conference center was just so noisy. Every mm. so often you could, like, randomly it would it would start talking and you'd see the little lips, the light lips moving on the front. And it looks very cute when it's talking. Yeah. But it was just way too noisy in there for us to get a good demo. So your thoughts just overall on integrating Mycroft at more than just, to me, and I, I wonder for you too, it seems to be more compelling than just a little hardware device. I would like to see that just be one representation of how I interact with Mycroft. Do you, do right. you see it being much bigger than, than just a hardware device? So you were, you were talking there about you know it having access to like your most recent apps and stuff like most modern desktops have that kind of you know surfacing that kind of data mm -hmm. or using stuff like Zeitgeist which would keep track of which documents you've opened right. you know if you could say to Mycroft open the document I had open last Tuesday when I was listening to ABBA or something you know because you remembered the document and what you were listening to at the time that's that is kind of the purpose of zeitgeist that it, it it records what you're doing all the time so there's a data source there that could certainly be mined by uh mycroft and i think that that would be awesome if it was all integrated together the mycroft project is an interesting one to watch because uh boy the timing is perfect it really, really is it yeah. was just I'm I'm so thrilled that we're not really behind the curveball. It curve really felt this. like we were going to be missing out, you know, before Minecraft started. I mean, getting all the momentum they have now. But since uh, Ryan Sipes, who I I think is just great, I think Ryan he's a great. Not only not only is Ryan uh, uh, very well very well um, spoken, and he articulates uh, the project's a vision and advocate. goals. Uh, and uh, but he's also just a super nice guy to hang out with. And uh, chat with, and he was going to join us today, but I'm assuming <clears throat> he's just super busy because uh, he'd emailed me earlier today saying, "Hey, can I make it?" And I said, "Yeah, absolutely." Uh, so that's that's totally understandable. I wonder come back anytime if he if he was here. What I would like to ask him, the, probably the hardest question I would have had for him is is the is, is it getting too much? Is is it growing too fast? Uh, there's this weird thing that. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but I could I could tell I could tell that our audience was not super impressed by this update and was having a hard time parsing it. Um, and so pretty, it, it is pretty long and it's long, dense, and it's not traditionally as well done as communication from the Minecraft project. And so I I think it kind of fell a little flatter than maybe they were expecting, or at least I was expecting, because I think this is a bigger deal than people are realizing. And um, I don't know if every every single stupid thing was well, not stupid, but if every single little thing needs a video with some hipster music and you know a tweet or Chris, what, you know that it does. Okay, that's that's probably true. Yeah, and but, a scrolly website. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe I just would like to ask him. And what I'm worried about is does something like this that has not just their ideas of what would be great, but then once you start talking to other people. And you start working with other groups. A lot of other ideas start getting brought into the mix. People start telling you you should do this. You also got to right. do this. Get involved with this. Go to this event. Scope Make sure you talk creep. to these people. Make sure you talk. And I wonder if scope creep is is becoming an issue at all. So uh, maybe Ryan will join us soon. We can talk about that because even even from the pro from the uh, perspective of managing an open source project that is fairly well watched, what's that like? What does that feel like? What happens if you pick, if you want to, if you decide you're going to hit your, like, really, Wimpy to this, some degree has this too with Ubuntu mm -hmm. Mate. Absolutely. And, you know, and of course, Richard has this with OpenSUSE. What is it like? Oh, yeah. 
when that when you know when you all of a sudden you're dealing with something that's that is very very heavily watched. Richard, do you do you have any thoughts just off the top of your head since I just sort of sprung this on you? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I've kind of got an example today. I mean, we've, we've just released 42.2 Alpha 1. Like, we we thought we knew the scope, we knew it, everything, and, like, the first bunch of feedback is, oh, we want this extra thing and this extra thing and this thing. Like, mm-hmm. uh, it, on one hand, you want to say yes to everything because uh, it's, you know, it, it, part of that's, you know, where the enthusiasm comes from. On the other hand, you can see if you say yes to everything, you're going to end up with an ungodly mess. Yeah, like you get Absolutely. monsters go creep. North Ranger, you had a positive spin? I'd love to hear that. Yeah, so, you know, you talk about what they've been out in the community talking about. You worry about the scope creep. Um, I think you're totally right on the timing of this, that um, I think their time actually is good because, you know, people's awareness of these types of devices and these types of services is constantly increasing with, um, Amazon Echo and Google Now and Siri, but you know all of those existing solutions are, you know, very much focused on Amazon wants to sell you stuff. Uh, Google wants to mine all your s. Um, <laughs> whereas Mycroft, you, you know, if, if you set aside what they're talking about and focus on what they've actually done, um, they're showing real hardware and they're releasing the core, the the things that. Um, you have to get right the speech recognition, um, the ability to create uh, intents and create actions. Um, and that's where I think the the open source community can take it and run with it. Yeah, that's well said. And also, just as a tip of the hat to the Minecraft project, uh, when you uh, go to sign up for that account where, where, where Ham said he just uses Google and you could just super right. quick get in there and get the speech recognition, they literally say, like, hey, if you want to help out, and give us a little financial contribution, we're going to be able to replace this whole proprietary have to log in thing way faster. Nice. And we'll have the open source solution ready to go. It's That's our direction we're going. We're going to get there one way or another. Here's a couple of ways you can help us get there faster. Yeah. And I, you know, you look at Mycroft as a project that was funded initially by the community and they're not done yet. And that I thought, I thought what that what that represented was a super clever way to continue right. additional bits of funding because you know, you know that they can't just go raise even if they raised five hundred thousand dollars. That money's going to run out when you start hiring people and you start having expenses and you start having to go to events. And they're doing done. like world class work here. You know, like these are the things that like yeah. Of course, they're having to like this is like you have to outsource some of this stuff because right now all the solutions that anyone uses are proprietary. So they're like exploring new ground and doing work that a lot of them could be paid good money to do with yeah. companies. So I think it's, I, and I, I really hope they come up with a solid revenue stream uh, that doesn't necessarily involve data analytics of their customers. But it comes, you know, a great way to raise money that contributes back to the project because you want to see something like this continue. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool that it's gotten this far because of community funding so far. And then, of course, open source development. All right, let's take a moment. Now, speaking of community funding, it's time to talk about the Librem 11. It's called and dubbed the Surface Book for those of you who care about your privacy and your freedom. What? Okay, I have a few thoughts on this as somebody who uh, funded their first attempt at crowdfunding hardware, the Librem 15. So come over here into the hallway with me for just a moment, Wes, and let's talk about Linux Academy. Linux Academy. Dot com. Go slash there unplugged. Now. Slash Do unplugged. It. You got to go there to get the discount. Go there now. And support the show. So, Wes, let's get real while we're out here in the hallway. If you don't know this, we're out in the hallway right now. We stepped out of the studio. The hallway we, always sounds like this. This is how it sounds at Jupiter Broadcasting Studios. <laughs> of course, we got all these computers here. This is why it sounds like this. If Relax you want to. in the hallway. Chill in the hallway, Wes. If you want to get your employer's attention, if you want to maybe do a little better on the next review or get a raise, you know that one of the ways to do that is to continue your education and show them you're expanding your knowledge set. It's, leg- it's legitimately one of the best ways to get your employer's attention. It's one of the best ways to make you more employable, and it's also a great way to challenge yourself. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. Come on, step out here into the hallway with us and think about it just for a little bit. Go there and try them out. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. You get a discount. They have self-paced courses with 2,404 to 7 videos, scenario-based labs that put you in the middle of everyday common tasks, instructor mentoring. Woo! Could you imagine you're standing out here in the hallway? Academy tell you what to do. You're out here on the hallway. You're looking at your smartphone. You're thinking, you know what I need? I need help. They got it. Instructor mentoring. Because you're in the hallway right right now. (laughs) 
<laughs> Linux Academy. <laughs> Linux Academy. They got graded server exercises. Sign up right now. Because <laughs> this is not neural programming. This is the hallway, okay? This is the hallway. This is not neural programming. <laughs> LinuxAcademy.com slash unplug. You go to you go there, you learn more, you got graded server exercises. So that way, if you're like me and you S your pants when you gotta take a test, you know what I don't like is scenarios where there's no option other than win lose. I like a couple <laughs> of options. I want I want a plan B. I want a plan B. Here, now come over here. Now let's uh, let's let's step into the computer room. Yeah, okay. So here we're in the computer room now, Wes. Right next to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> just, we got data to crunch here, folks. Yeah, yeah, and, and the way we learned how to do that is Linux Academy. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplug. They got the best courseware. I'm going to say it right now. The best courseware on the Red Hat stuff. Oh, you got stuck in, a, uh, in the DevOps position all of a sudden? Oh, I shouldn't say stuck. I One, shouldn't. they'll tell you what that term means. Yeah. <laughs> Two, they'll tell you how to effectively use Boom. those tool sets. They've also got great, great courseware on Amazon Web Services, Android Development, Ruby, OPHP, and their courseware comes with their servers. What? <laughs> Had we not mentioned that? I gotta say, I should have mentioned at the top. See if I, I'm a rookie here. I should have mentioned at the top. You get to choose from seven plus distributions. No, this is not neural programming. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you get seven. Seven plus distributions. And then they automatically adjust the courseware. Virtual That's machines. Crazy. They, they spin that up on demand. They spin up that, the, and it matches the courseware. Now, think about that. That's how you know that they like actually know how to use this stuff. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. Go check them out. They got great instructor mentoring. They have a community stacked full of Jupyter Broadcasting members. And I think the other thing that really speaks for them is they legitimately have constant results. It's really neat. And actually, I like it when you tweet me and you tell me about it, too. So thanks, you guys. Keep LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. All right, so we've stepped back into the studio. We're no longer in the hallway or the computer lab no. or whatever that last room was. Uh, I want to talk about the Librem 10, a 10.1-inch, 2-in-1 detachable laptop tablet designed to protect your digital life. From the purism, folks, they say it's beautiful freedom, and they believe in users' rights. It's a tablet and a laptop. They've put, they say, a ton of work to make the GNOME shell ready for this. It ships, Yeah, and it ships pure OS, and they got a video. It doesn't really say much. But I guess I guess I could I could read you the highlights because I don't think there's actually any any voice over here. So they say what's on your tablet? Privacy isn't about what you want to hide, it's about what you need to protect. If you could design the ultimate tablet, what would it be? You are helping design your next computer. We are listening. Hey, it's Todd. Your current computer and service providers know more about you than anybody else. Apple, Google, or Microsoft hold the master key to your digital life. You want a computer designed to protect you rather than monitor you. Introducing the Librem 11, the latest computer from Purism designed by you to protect your digital life. An 11-inch, 2-in-1, detachable, privacy, security, and freedom-focused computer. Running PureOS 3.0, where you hold the master key to your entire digital life. All right! They've been to the Chris Last School of, of music overlays here. <laughs> the Libram 11 turns off remote spying with hardware kill switches. It does not track you at all nor does it phone home to the parent company. The Libra 11 runs free software with All the right. source code available to verify that it protects your digital rights. Get that source code. And above all else, makes protecting yourself as easy as turning it on. Yeah! OMG, OMG, OMG. At Purism, we believe protecting your digital rights should be easier than giving them up. We make hardware and software that is designed to protect your digital life. In order to achieve this all goal, right. Purism has amassed an amazing team of the best freedom like fighters from all over the world. What up? Selfie cam. With your help, Purism will continue leading the way in protecting everybody's digital life. Thank you. 
Man, I'll tell you what, I'm pretty stoked about that hammock in the back of Todd's yeah, yard right? there. That's nice. So <laughs> that, looks, that shows he's got good taste. Yeah, right? that looks comfy. I'm more yeah. confident now. So the Librem 11, a two-in-one tablet that protects your privacy, uh, they want to raise $150,000. They have two months left, so it's a real long one over on Indiegogo, a real nice and long one. And uh, they've so far raised $12,455 with only 11 backers. Mm. 11 backers. Starting at $999, $999. You can get $599 if you want a less capable one. <laughs> uh, hmm. So uh, I got a lot of thoughts on this. But I guess I wanted to open it up to you first, Wes, and then I'll toss it over to the mumble room after that. Uh, what do you think? Do you, at this point, what do you? What is just your initial thoughts? So, I mean, people might not be fully familiar with my history with the company. So, that aside, I mean, what is just your initial thoughts on something like this? There are some good things and some bad things. They're like very zoomed in on this Core M processor here on the page, which has me a little off put already. But I think the video was good. I think there are some people with very good intentions behind this. Bringing in your history there, you know, I do have some questions about if they'll be able to ship it, what it really will look like. And I also don't know how much I'm that interested in the in the tablet two-in-one workflow anyway. Here's my question. I don't know how to state this in a way that doesn't, that, that maybe if you're not already there with me, you might not understand. But um, inherently... Would you agree or disagree that one of the features of a tablet is build quality? Yeah, I would agree. I mean... And would you agree or disagree that one of the features of a tablet is content consumption and therefore its ecosystem? Yep. And would you agree that one of the things of a tablet that makes it compelling to a large market is a healthy accessory ecosystem? Maybe like cases for kids... Charging stations for people that want to have multiple charging options, Bluetooth speakers that have holders that are, are I mean, you know, like connector speakers and chargers that hold it, alarm clocks and things like that. Like, it's an ecosystem that I would say you could say makes a, a, a tablet viable. Would you, would you agree with that ev to some degree or not? No, I, I mean, I, I think I see what you're saying. And that, I mean, right there, that limits the scope of who could be interested in this. I, I mean, if if I'm really curious to see what they say. You've said they've done a lot to the gnome shell. It, it would be really interesting to see this succeed. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to preclude this being an awesome product. Well, I mean, for a tablet, so it's going to have Linux, right. 16 gigabytes of RAM, uh, user upgradable, easily removable screws, six to eight battery lives, hardware kill switches for wireless Bluetooth, camera, microphone, GPS, and the cellular data if you get it. Oh wow, no oh, cellular data. So yeah. so. I think it, it ties back with the laptop, you know, with the, there's a lot of, a lot of things here that I could really like, and I'd love to see it succeed. I don't know that it will, and I don't know that what percentage of success that they do achieve will be enough to make it worthwhile. Hmm. Anyone in the moment room have any thoughts about, I mean, is this a good pivot? Is this maybe a pivot from building, trying to compete in the traditional laptop space and saying, we're going to go after this sort of niche here, mm. the surface niche. Yeah, because if what were, what the air they were competing in before, there were a lot of providers like uh, in Europe, there's Androware and uh, Schenker and PC Specialist. There were a lot of boutique companies that just repackaged Clefo products, but there, there doesn't seem, from these companies, there doesn't seem any proper surface competitors. So I think it's a nice niche to go into. And from my experiences with my brother Surface Pro and with GNOME, I really, really want to experience how GNOME works on a proper tablet, because I think it would be a very good experience of having a full desktop into a tablet with a good desktop environment that integrates both ideas. So I think it's a good idea. Bobby, what are your thoughts on it? As someone who uh, worked on a product which landed on a tablet that got some interesting feedback recently, I would say the thing they need to nail is not just the the hardware build quality, but um, people can be quite forgiving of hardware build quality if if it's at the right price point. But what they often can't forgive is poor quality or unfinished software. Hmm. And if well, if they don't if they don't get that nailed, then People who've backed it might might revolt slightly. Do you think they could spend, say, 
several months with GNOME 3 shell and uh, get GNOME shell in a state that is uh, usable in a touch environment? To be fair, I haven't used GNOME shell for a long time, so I, d I don't know what state it's in in a touch environment. I haven't got it on any machines that have got a touch screen, so I don't know, um, and I don't know how touch oriented i know everyone who sees any operating system that has big icons immediately erroneously thinks it's a touch ui but um i, I don't know how well known shell is suited to touch at the moment and so i don't know how far they've got to go i just think they need to focus on that quite hard i think it comes down to the apps i think uh, the shell does okay I, I mean i've used it on like not a great some like mediocre touch interfaces and like launching apps and that kind of stuff is fine it'll depend on like you know if you use chromium it'll do well or Chrome, uh, maybe some other web browsers yeah. less so, or similar for the rest of your apps. You know, if you're using Linux apps that just aren't going to work with touch, it's going to be painful. But and yeah, Wes, what about like gestures and pinching and things like that? So uh, I, I have I have not read through the whole post where they say all the work they did for GNOME, but I know they did address some of that. Uh, they also they say they're going to eventually have optional docking station features like a power connector, an RJ45 Ethernet port, HDMI out, two USB ports. I'm really... I like how they solved the fan problem with not having a fan. Yeah, that is nice. That's yeah. what, That was my solution, too. Uh, <laughs> I guess they just adopted my solution from their laptop problem. Now, I look at this and I think to myself, <laughs> it's really, really, really a difficult position to be in, to be a project out in the open like this, hardware or software, and be crowdfunded and have to publicly fail a few times, which a lot of companies and a lot of initiatives and a lot of projects do. But this now, is right out in the open. Yeah, and there's money on the line, and uh, like is this this you could see two ways. This could be purism abandoning the laptop line and moving over, a, or not abandoning. That's the wrong way to put it. This is purism redirecting their attention and getting distracted by a, by a shiny, and not focusing on just nailing and really making something good, and then moving on to the next thing. They feel like they haven't finished the last thing. But you could also look at it and say, this is a company that is recognizing the competitive landscape and wants to contribute something unique and cater to a market that wants that product but wants to have some of their essential requirements met. Right. And they're, uh, they're recognizing that and saying, you know what, we couldn't nail this, but we think we can nail that. And so we're going to pivot, and we're going to try to make that our thing. If That's they also reasonable. Literally say that, then it would be like, well, you admit your mistake, but they haven't done so. Well, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, no, true. But I'm just of two minds of this thing. You know, right. I'm, I look at it and I go, I don't know. I, I it would I'm, be really cool to have a Linux tablet that I loved using. Like that would be awesome. Yeah, I look at that and I go, geez, a quad core, uh, you know, micro SD slot, HDMI out, docking station. And if it like if it like the keyboard uh, like clip in business works well and it doesn't feel chintzy, then I'm I'm that would be great. All right, Jama Biz, <laughs> I don't know how you say your uh, I don't, <laughs> JMA BBZ. <laughs> go ahead, your right. thoughts on crowdfunding. Yeah, I mean, with crowdfunding, you are essentially not buying a product you're just investing in the hope that and they have managed to get a product out it wasn't very good um hopefully this one will be, will be better um we'll have to wait and see um but they are trying and hopefully they're contributing back to no but as always there's a risk with crowdfunding and people need to be aware of that well i want True. to uh i want to say you know they contacted us after my libram 15 review and uh, which is uh, that you guys can go find on your own and they said, well, would you be willing to try the Librem 13? Because we really think we did a much better job with the Librem 13. We got a better hardware partner. We had, a, we had a chance to do it better. Would you be willing to look at that? I him and I hawed about it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't, I'm not a big 13-inch laptop guy. I'm more of a 15-inch laptop person. Who and, are you? And I was a little burned, right? I was a little burned by them, so I thought that might influence my review. So what I decided... Should have Noah review it. Right. That guy loves 13-inch laptops. Loves them. And he didn't get burned by the 15-inch laptop. No skin off his back. Right. 
So on this, on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, on Sunday's episode, we're going to review the Librem 13. Ooh. Yeah. And exciting. We're, and, I, and it's not that I want to keep doing all these hardware reviews over and over again, but I, th- every, every single day I get an email about the perfect Linux laptop. And every single week on Reddit, I see a thread about the perfect Linux laptop. And once a month, somebody on Hacker News talks about how they have found the perfect Linux right. laptop. It's- it's talked about all the time. So we're going to look at the Librem 13 on the Linux Action Show and see if they nailed that product. And my estimation is, depending on how well they did that, when they got another chance, yep. how well they did on the Librem 13, if they if they nailed that, if Noah says they did a great job. Because that is really the test. Is like, and, they just need to keep a some amount of people that will keep funding them and letting them progress. As a and the brown bear loves himself the 13-inch laptop. So if they nailed the 13-inch laptop... Um, then I think this is I think this might be a viable project. Like you could you could yep. rely on them to really be able to iterate on something. Right. So we'll see. I don't know. He has I specifically asked him not to really give me any details about it. I want to find out during the show. So he's had it for like three weeks or something. Sounds like a good one to watch live. Yeah. Which has been interesting because he's received like maybe four. I don't know. He's had it for a while. And uh, he got it like during the Oryx. So he's had the Oryx and the Libra and side the by sides. Wow. Yeah, it should be a really interesting review. So we'll talk about that on Sunday's show. But uh, we'll have links to this crowdfunding campaign if you want to go get yourself one. Um, maybe maybe just hang out. You got the thing's got two months. It's a long one, so uh, maybe just wait for a little bit and see where it goes. Ooh! If you want to if you want to support something today, check this out, Wes. Patreon.com/slash today. That's where you go to fund the network. Now this this page is all jacked up. It's got like stuff on there about Tech Talk today. It's got a video of me with like an old hairstyle, which is just how to look date. at. Oh, nineties. Uh, <sighs> but none of that matters. Go because there anyway. What it's really just about? Type your credit card in. What Chris, is? Put on the confusion. Uh-huh. Music. I'm putting it in there right now. I'm putting it in there. Okay. Wait. No. Nothing. Nothing. Let's go to the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> you want to go? To... <laughs> okay. Hold on, Wes. We'll go to the hallway. Hold on, Wes. We're out in the hallway. There Just you go. and me. Nobody's here. Tell them about Patreon. Patreon.com/slash/today. This is where you go to support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network and orient our compass towards our audience. Now, I say that in a really kind of nice, fancy way, right? Orient our compass towards our audience. What does that really mean? I'll tell you, Wes. Well, just because we're out in the hallway. It's just you and me. Tell us, Chris. If we weren't in the hallway, I wouldn't say this. Tell us now. Advertising on the web's only going to work for so long. It eventually it's going to go bust. I'll say it right now. And if you've read the New York Times recently, you know that uh, NPR and uh, a bunch of other uh, podcast advertising brokers are going to screw it all up for all of us. They're really messing it up bad. They want Apple to create its own garden system around podcasting. Google Play now has its own walled garden that has its own stats and rehosts our files. It is, Wes, if we weren't out in the hallway right now, right now legitimately standing in the hallway, I wouldn't say this. It ain't going to work much longer. And that's why I think we've talked about crowdfunding today from a multiple set of angles. I think this is a big one. What it really does is it makes your priority your crowdfunding source. or Your priority is going to be what your funding source is. Always. That, I think, is really all you need to know. And we want our priority to be the audience. Patreon.com slash today. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say more than that because we're, we're in the hallway. Patreon. If we were in a different room, I might say something else. But that's all I want to say about it. You might also find an extended live edition live. of this show. Extended live. Extended live. Extended live. Live. Extended live edition of this show at patreon.com slash today. Full featured. 601 patrons. That's really great. We're getting close. Uh, well, by close, I mean we need to double that. But once we double that... Subscribe then, again. Then. Three times. Then I'll do all these shows topless. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, pay $5 more than that and sure, Chris wears two shirts. <laughs> Oh man, I was, I was ready to see what you'd say about that. No, I'm 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 kidding. But patreoncom slash today. We are beginning to post the uh, live recordings of our shows, the whole thing. I love it. I was already recording the live stream, so it's just Were like, you really? Oh yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it's more fun. I love the live stream. They are they are better, right? Right? And sometimes yeah. I can't be there or I'm out and about or whatever. And uh, so now you guys do all the hard work for me and since I'm a patron already, like it's it's an awesome benefit. Yeah, it's an early system. We're still setting it up, but if you want to get in on it, what essentially it lets you do is we're posting a few shows throughout the week, the entire live stream. Now, I think it's funny cuz um I don't know if people really like jumped on it, but I posted the TechSnap one, and that's the first time we have ever 
showed any live clips. We've never do outtakes in TechSnap. It's nothing like Unfiltered that. Unfiltered Alan. It's, it's just what's in there. And the moment, my favorite moment in that, and it's right there if you're a Patreon, is it starts with Alan troubleshooting uh, his, his microphone. And what, what, was, what is revealed is that A... Alan Jude has a favorite USB port, <laughs> and B, Alan Jude broke his favorite USB oh, port. Oh yeah. man! And so the whole thing is quite funny, and it's just a, it's a brilliant like example of what happens on the live stream before TechSnap that no one ever sees unless you make it. Totally different show. And and now with this new Linux powered OBS rig we have here, doing this extra work and all these extra satcoms we got going, we thought now is the point. Now we can finally contribute back to our patrons. And we specifically had a milestone we wanted to reach to be able to financially do that. And it, it worked out perfectly. As we crossed that milestone, the hardware went into place. That's awesome. And now we're delivering those exclusives to our patrons. Patreon.com slash today. You start at the $3 level. You go all the way up. They got swag levels. We got all that. Then people over there are crazy. Just ignore everything else on the page that doesn't, well, you actually, it's been getting updated over time. It's been getting quite uh, fancied up. We got like a new cord cutting level, if you're a cord cutter. Yeah, Ooh, like your Netflix and your Hulu. $10 or more. Yeah, read that. Isn't that... Is the... You're a cord cutter. You decided mainstream cable isn't how you want to consume content anymore. And it turns out G- JB has just what you need. hey This level means you support content that is tailored to your technical needs and you are still saving money. That's true. $10 a month is nothing. Yeah, I know, right? I know. So check it out. Patreon.com slash today. You support the whole network. And uh, we have big things coming that we want to accomplish in 2016 that I feel like... See, I, now you've proven it, right? Like, you've shown, like, you give more money, you get more. I feel out like of the we have. I feel like we've delivered, and I. You I want, want Chris to go live in an RV and travel around the country? <laughs> Bam, he'll do it. Well, no, no, that's not even on there. No, what, what really it's about is it's not about me. It is. It is about being able to launch new shows and not have to think about sponsors first. It's about being able to determine what what 601 people like, not what 100,000 people might like. See, one of the fundamental problems we have at the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, and it is literally our biggest competitive disadvantage, is we cover Linux and open source. And I, it's the stuff we love, and that's why we cover it. But it, it is the niche of the niche. Technology podcasting is a niche. Open source and Linux is a niche within that niche. Like, Mac and Windows are niches within that category. <laughs> Imagine, right, where desktop Linux and the concerns of the open source community fit within that overall consumer market. We're tiny. We're absolutely tiny. And that's why you don't see us often featured in iTunes. That's why you don't necessarily see us listed in Pocket Cast network lists. Right. Because you'll see, you'll see, ti- you'll see networks that literally get half the downloads we get listed there simply because they cover topics that appeal to a wider audience. So one of our major competitive disadvantages is that we talk about Linux and open source, but at the same time, that's our biggest competitive advantage because that's all we're really about. We really dig into that stuff on these shows. And if you enjoy that content, if that is something that's provided value to you or something that you just have listened to over and over again and enjoyed, patreon.com slash today. We need you because we do not have the advantages that some of the other podcast networks have by covering Apple and iPhones and everything Google does and all of that extra crap that we're all sick and tired of hearing about all the time. And so that's why we're really, really hoping that we can funnel more attention to our Patreon and grow that. Because that really then unhinges us and allows us to go cray cray. Cray cray, Wes. And it's great to have a system like Patreon where you really can just give money right to the awesome people who make the shows. And you get a little extra bonuses. Get them bonuses. Patreon.com slash today. Thank you, everybody who does support us. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the Unplugged Program. Oh, Wes. I feel like we could go on more and more. The whole episode had a thread through it. It did. And I find that to be interesting since it's not really intentional with this (laughs) show. This is the Unplugged Program, and you can hang out with us live over jblive.tv. Please do. Jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. If you want to think bots do it, I'll, I'll let you believe that. I'll let you believe that. It's fine. We have a mumble room if you want to participate in our virtual lug. And last but not least, we love your feedback at linuxactionshow.reddit. Dot com. Join us in the hallway. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Unplugged. See you back here next Tuesday. Get it.
get out of here. Uh, I've never installed GNU slash Linux. It's for people who like to mess with computers. All right, so before we start the show, Mr. Corpse brought it up in the mumble room, and it's amazing. Holy smokes. When I got on the live stream today, this was still at 3 million. It's already at 4 million. Wow. So this is the Pebble 2, Time 2, and the new Pebble Core. It already has 21,000 backers. With 36 days left to go, they had a goal of a million dollars. They've now raised wow. $4 million. And th- here, let's just this, this is very perfect timing because uh, some of the discussions we're going to get into today are very much around open source projects like the Mycroft device and others that are open crowdfunded. Open source, open, open, different, not necessarily Kickstarter, but different methodologies of funding. And here is one of the all-time big names on Kickstarter launching this today. I think it's kind of uh, perfect timing. I don't hear anything, though. It's all screwed up. (sighs) I don't know what happened there. That was really set up pretty well, too. It's kind of a shame. Ah. Uh, I don't know. Let's go HTML5. Damn it, Linux. Why are you doing this to me now? <laughs> What's going on, baby? Don't you love me? <laughs> don't you love me, Linux? Ah, <coughs> uh, you know, I watched this not 35 minutes ago, and I worked just fine. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, mustaches, dude. Mustaches. Um, hmm. Well... Okay, let's uh, let's bust it out. Let's go into the lab. Let's figure out what's going on here. I'm gonna pop and lock my audio interface. Stand by! Live hot swap in progress! Okay! Hold on! Hold on! Reswapping! Utilizing GNOME extension to re-default. Sound interface recognized. Original output selected. Refreshing web page. Activating video. Hey, it did it. Ooh. Nice. That was pretty. Right, I'm going to reset You're that up in purpose. IT wizard. <laughs> that was not only, not only. Okay, okay. Now, I will say, second. though, YouTube DL downloads from Kickstarter just Oh, fine. nice. Good to I know. I also have it here. In Thanks. If you want. Uh, but not only did that solve the problem, but there were, I, I, there were sound effects and live commentary. That is, see, that's how you know I used to do IT right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now shut up, Wes. We're going to start over again. Because I want that S to be smooth, okay? All right? Okay? <sighs> Man. Almost blew that S, Wes. This is CNN Breaking News. Now, this is almost perfect timing for the big show today. Wait, no, that's not the... Damn it, see, now I'm all off! Damn. Man. <laughs> I just, We're the cute little show. Chris. OMG, OMG, OMG. Ah, I'm too warm, Wes. I'm too warm. Ah. All right, fine. Here, what? The jacket's coming off. Even though I love this Matei jacket, which Wes commented it is on, beautiful. It's a nice Ubuntu Matei jacket uh, that was sent to me by Mr. Wimpy, and I really like it. And it was pleasant in here until the damn log guy started doing his thing. So now, maybe he's gone. If you all could get your crap together, we're going to start over, okay? And we're not going to call it the big show.